All right, thanks everybody for joining today. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Randall Stevens. Um, I've got my camera on so you guys can see me up here. I'm uh, gonna be walking you through uh, this presentation today. Uh, the topic is gonna be to talk about cloud storage and cloud management of content. Uh, I'm gonna spin the front part of this presentation using this deck. I'm gonna uh, first lay out the problem uh, kind of definition as we see it, uh, what we've been trying to work on and solve, walk you through what our strategy is to solve that. And then um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time just kind of showing you, um, uh, I'll say broad uh, architecture of at a, at a very high level, not really technical about how storage systems work and the way to think about the cloud as an integral part of that. And then uh, I'm gonna use that to, um, to kind of talk about our roadmap and show you some of the things that we're doing and where we're moving uh, with, with Avail on that front. And then uh, assuming that we can get through this with enough time, I'll give you a little sneak peek. If any of your current customers that are on the call, I'll give you a little sneak peek of, um, we have an imminent new release called Avail 4.0 that's coming. I'll give you a little sneak peek of that and how that ties in with everything that we're talking about here. So I usually like to, you know, before we dive into any of the details and features and things that we're attacking, try to frame this with a little bit of an understanding about the way we're thinking about the broader problem. 20,000 foot, 50,000 foot, 100,000 foot view of what the problem is that we think that's going on and then ultimately how we're trying to address it. <clears throat> so when we talk about content and content management, you know, the word, I think they're interchangeable. We use the word information sometime, content, um, content in the, in the context that we're talking about it is usually information that's stored in a file and the file becomes the content that somebody's trying to manage. That could be a Revit family file, but it could just as easily be a photograph or a PDF document of something. So uh, from our vantage point, uh, we very loosely consider all of that content, files, data, information, kind of talk about this stuff interchangeably. Um, the, the way that we describe the overall problem in, a, in, this, in, in the AEC industry is that you know, we're obviously all swimming. We're, we're creating a lot of information <laughs> and that information is living in a lot of different places. And we're lucky enough over the last 20 years, right, to have advanced networking and the internet and access to these places where all this information is. But the way we view it is it's become this very outward experience where the user has to go and find this information you know, in these different systems where it's being stored, which is a very complex um, thing when you step back and think about it from that standpoint about where, right, where information is, the location uh, of that in order to put your hands on it. So um, I haven't found any better way to say this, uh, but the way I've thought about this over the, over the years is that uh, the network is in place, call it the internet. Uh, we have basically the internet tying our local networks right into the broader network. Uh, and because the network's in place, right, there's no reason that we couldn't start to bring that information back to the end user. So rather than the end user having to think about going to information, um, we should be able to begin to bring that information back to the end user. So I call this inverting the web. So if, the, if you think about that the internet's in place and it's now connecting us to all the different places where information lives, uh, that's the complexity that we now have to overcome is that information is beginning to live in lots of places and it becomes overwhelming to figure out how to um, efficiently be able to put your hands on it. So this is really at the core of what we're, philosophy of what we're trying to do with Avail. We're always trying to bring information back to the end user. And I think it's just an important first way of thinking as we kind of lay out the way that we're thinking about um, solving some of these problems. What's generating all, all the content are all these siloed, what we would call siloed applications. So we've, the industry's really spent the last 40 years, right, with the 30, 40 years with the advent of the personal computer, beginning to run these applications on their desk. And the work product is basically to create information, save it out in a file and put it somewhere on the network so that somebody else can get to it or that you, you yourself can get back to it at some point. So that those, you know, literally 
what have become hundreds of siloed applications. It's not unusual for us to talk to customers who have between 100 and 200 different applications in use in their work environment. That is an indicator of what's what's causing the problem, that all of these tools are sitting on people's desks, people file open, people want to save that information out. And we've described this as what we call the loose content problem. It's like every time that they're saving out or creating some information and needing to store that somewhere, they're either storing that over in, in a network drive somewhere, in a library, or related to the project, or more and more uh, that may not be the local, even the local network. It may be a cloud storage device somewhere. It could be your inbox or Dropbox uh, that you're trying to share and work with people outside of your firm's firewall. Uh, so it's just, or, you know, you're working in uh, Autodesk BIM 360 docs now around your project data. So it's just becoming increasingly complex about where, right? So this is what we would call, uh, because all of these systems use, generally use a file system, right? Well, we're all used to folder way of organizing things. That location is becoming increasingly complex about where something is. So now you do add in all of these cloud-based locations, you know, Autodesk Forge platform with BIM 360, um, uh, you know, uh, Trimble, right, with their ProjectWise and Connect uh, solutions. You know, it's just getting increasingly complex because the cloud is just adding yet another place where this information can live, wants to live for very good reasons. So all of those systems, typically, if you go start looking at them, use the traditional file system as their front end. So it's a folder-based hierarchical system for trying to start to organize these files or those loose files to try to give you now some semblance of being able to get back to that information. And obviously, most of them have some sort of a search feature that uh, you don't have to necessarily just browse those folders. Hopefully, you can search it. But, um, you know, the uh, when we talk about cloud, uh, I usually like to throw this up, you know, ultimately, there really is no cloud. It's just another drive somewhere where data is being stored. The complexity that that brings into the mix is that, that that storage location is probably not inside your company's network. So it's not what we would call inside the firewall of the company. It's yet another place where you now have to get to that information. I'll kind of start drilling in uh, to, to some of the things that we've done recently. We just released a new update to Avail. It's our 3.15 release, 3.15 of the Avail desktop. But there's two, two features that are important to this discussion. One is we began working six or eight months ago on a project where we basically convert what we call virtualize the thumbnails away from the file. So if you're not familiar with the way that when you're in something like Windows File Explorer and you, get, and you wanna see an image or see a thumbnail of that file, that typically is data that's stored in the file itself. So when you're rendering that inside of, of your Windows File Explorer or someplace else, that thumbnail is coming actually from the file and the piece of software that you're viewing it from has to be able to ex extract that from the file in order to see it. Well, because of what's going on with the cloud, I'll get into this in a second when I show you some of the higher level diagrams, that creates some challenges because in order for the, for you to be able to see that thumbnail, you actually have to have possession of the file. Your local computer actually has to be able to touch that file on the local file system. So um, we began uh, working on, as part of what we were doing with Avail, the ability to basically abstract the thumbnails away from the file itself so that we could display those very efficiently in Avail. So we are, uh, as you can see here in this slide, we're separating the thumbnail from that host file. Doesn't mean that that doesn't still exist in the file, but we're, we basically are creating this abstraction layer. What that's allowing us to do now is solve some of the problems about network latency and speed, uh, especially you know over the last couple of months as companies had people working from home and were VPNing into networks. Uh, you probably experienced these lags and being able to get some of that information. Well, a lot of that is because of the complexity in those kinds of situations that the file was actually having to be transferred across the network in order for you to be able to see, right, thumbnails and to browse uh, that experience. So, so we've been working on this uh, way that's now part of the application for virtualizing the thumbnail. 
signals, which creates just very fast response times then to being able to interact with this data, browse, search, that kind of information to get back to. So we think that that's one important um, piece of this puzzle. We also, in this 315 uh, release, began our, a, a project that was kind of on our roadmap that we accelerated, which was to not only, um, not only be able to serve content or manage content that's sitting on your local network, but to also be able to host that information in a cloud location so that if you were uh, needing to share that, let's say with somebody working from home uh, that they couldn't very easily get it or didn't want a VPN back into the network that you could actually uh, be able to host that information in a cloud location. So uh, that's now part of our 315 release. We've kind of been, uh, I'll say slow rolling that out uh, to select enterprise customers. Uh, but this basically lets you decide that you want to host your information, uh, you know, not on your local network, but through a centralized cloud location. And then ultimately that allows consumption of that information or content outside of your firewall. And um, as I'll show you, it's a strategy that lets you continue to have a master of the file that might be sitting locally with a distribution copy right, that sits in a cloud location so that others can consume it. Um, so that's been the um, um, uh, kind of major, two major new things that we've just released in our 3.15 release. Everybody's asking us about pricing on that. It's, it's basically free. We're not charging anything extra for it. What we've had to do though, there are hard costs with actually hosting and serving content out of cloud location. So we've put some limits to what's what's free under our current plans until we get a, our arms around that. And that is that, um, that, you're, uh, that you're basically storage, I've got this per month, I meant to change this in the slide. It's basically one gig of storage per baseline user, not per month, we actually have to pay for that monthly, but your aggregate usage is one gig. And then what's really expensive actually in this equation, I'll talk about this in a second when we talk at a really high level what's going on, it's actually the transfers that are expensive. It's really not that expensive to store things, it's much more expensive to transfer it. So that's why cloud and hybrid cloud kinds of solutions are in vogue because actually moving this data in and out of these cloud locations can be very expensive. So under our plan right now, uh, we're allowing uh, two gigs of um, per month of transfers uh, per what we call baseline user under our enterprise customers. So I'm gonna switch from slides now. Um, I'm gonna show you um, a couple of things. One is, let me just pull up a veil and show you very quickly. If I've got a channel of content. This, this is actually my demo showing that we can already manage. I saw a support ticket coming in earlier or question that somebody was posing about, you know, can Avail work with my OneDrive? Can it work with Google Drive? Can it work with, you know, BIM 360? It can actually already work with all of those. It really depends on how you've configured those systems. So uh, this is actually showing you Revit content that I'm hosting in Microsoft OneDrive, or I've got the very same content in a Google Drive or in BIM 360 uh, docs that I'm using to store and serve that info. So, and if I pop up Revit, you'll see that right inside my, if I close my desktop again, if I close my desktop app and I'm in my browser in Revit, I can actually see that same content right out of Autodesk BIM 360 Docs or right out of my Google Drive account or right out of uh, OneDrive. And this is taking advantage, what I'm showing you right here, uh, I don't want you to, to not understand what's going on, but that's taking advantage of the synchronization service that all of those services try to do, which is basically how do we cache that back down to a local um, local position so that you can now uh, use or consume that locally. So this is taking advantage of that. So I'm gonna pop and uh, bring the, um, uh, I didn't, while I'm relaunching this, I didn't tell those in attendance. I've got a couple of colleagues that are monitoring the, um, uh, the chat, the uh, question section. So if something comes up, uh, feel free to pop a question, you know, question in here, and we'll try to pause and get those answered here in a second. But um, um, but what I wanted to show you was that when I do uh, have a channel of content, if I right click now, I have the ability to two new options for what are called publishers in Avail, and that is 
the owners of those channels can decide to virtualize those thumbnails, which is going to run a process to abstract those thumbnails away from the file itself. So we're not relying on that. I've actually probably already virtualized these in these uh, locations. And then the other is to host that content in the cloud, which means I'm gonna now take copies of that and put them into a new cloud location that can then be shared uh, outside the firewall. So if I show you what that looks like, I'll show you just a couple of channels. Here's a local Revit channel of content that I had, but I chose to uh, virtualize some of those and share them in a cloud location. So when I do that as a publisher, I'm now seeing you know the local uh, the local reference to that. So if I right click on one of these and say open the location, this file is sitting here on my local network just as it always did right wherever I was managing that library. But if you notice up here in the top right of Avail, for that channel now, there is a cloud location. So now this is what the end users that have that cloud, you know, that channel shared out, you'll notice that there's little download icons. So if they need to get to that piece of content, it's that quickly that they can download it. And now it's going into the, a local cache for that end user. So now if I open the location of that file, what you're gonna see is that that's now gone into a local caching system uh, you know, for that end user. So this allows you know, remote worker, uh, maybe a remote office that's having trouble getting you know, to content on your network uh, for you to be able to share that out. But um, it's that simple. Uh, and then once you begin doing curation or any kind of work on this library locally, all you have to do is pop over here and say, I wanna publish these changes. Looks like I've made a couple of changes uh, to this and I publish those and the system goes to work and synchronizes that with the cloud location. So now I'm gonna have all those uh, changes synchronized with my cloud location for all of my users that are accessing it in that way. So pretty simple, um, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time going through that, but it's, it's that easy to be able to now host. Uh, and you'll notice that the end users will see that as hosted in the cloud. And if I did go back to my Revit implementation and closed my desktop app, what you're gonna see is that that cloud hosted location is now available directly inside of my Revit as a channel. And there I can click to download. And as soon as I download a piece of content, it becomes immediately available for use. So um, pretty nice feature. Uh, we're gonna be rolling that uh, and really pushing and talking about it a lot more when we release our uh, 4.0 release that's, that's coming, but it actually is a, a feature now that's in our 3.15 release and, and is available. We're kind of, we call it slow rolling it kind of out and um, getting customers you know, acclimated to it. And for those that wanna use it, it's available in 3.15. Um, all right, I'm gonna, <clears throat> any questions, uh, Todd, before I move on? Yeah, one came in just a moment ago. Um, does the cache clean every so often? Is there some way to limit how long or how much yep. data is cached? Good question. This is why I say we're slow rolling it. Today, it's just gonna start caching and building up that cache, so we're not doing anything to purge that cache. But as we start to move forward, we'll start to put some caching, you know, cache purging features and how long we want that stuff sitting around. As I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of walk you through some of the, so some of the other things that we're planning to do, which have to do with probably rearranging the way that we do cache uh, for better, I'll say path management. Uh, but uh, the answer, direct answer is no, we're not today purging any of that, uh, but we'll, we'll start to roll that in quickly. Hopefully before you run out of space, that'd be the goal. <laughs> um, you know, if you've got some sort of general purging on a per machine, if that's being managed across your firm, you know, you could purge that as often as you wanted to. And the users, when they come back, is just gonna basically have to download again instead of having that already, you know, cached in that local download location. Keep them rolling. If, uh, if I say something that makes you wanna ask a question, we'll look like another one popped in there, Todd. Uh, um, a follow-up comment on that. Okay. The follow-on would be versioning. Hmm. Um, yes, yes. The hosting in the cloud for sure sets this up for being able to do much simpler version control of files. Again, we haven't implemented any of that, but it's gonna to start to set the stage for that. So, good question. All right, so I'm gonna to turn to, I'll say more of a high level about ways of thinking about the cloud, cloud storage, and the different kinds of solutions that are out there. Our 
our view of that and thinking of it, and then how we're basically beginning to address that. And hopefully some of this, you know, what I'm gonna show you, this is a tool we use called Miro. So I'm gonna go in real time here, but basically um, I'm gonna just kind of use this to walk you through, um, you know, what's going on at a high level uh, when you're thinking about cloud and cloud storage. Cause it, you know, it's, it's complex, right? <laughs> like everything, it's like, uh, once you start kind of digging into it and, you know, it kind of sounds magical. I think, I think that's probably one of the reasons that we're, we're trying to really dig in this and, and want to do these kinds of webinars is there really is no magic to the cloud. It really is just another place to store information with some new added complexity, right? It's got a bunch of advantages, but it also creates a bunch of new challenges and problems. And I'm sure I'm not, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir as far as that goes to the people that are on the, on the line. So um, I've got some diagrams here that I'm going to kind of walk you through to kind of explain from our vantage point, the way we think about that. I always uh, give the caveat, I'm an architect by training. I am not a network architect. I am not a network engineer. Everything I know about networking is just school of hard knocks. Uh, and obviously working on this problem has required us to kind of dig in and try to understand the technologies a little more so that we can interact with them. But um, um, what I'm gonna show you is, um, you know, when, when you look at, where a veil is concentrated. That's the top part of this graph. Basically, we've concentrated these uh, first three years that the product was on the market on helping our customers manage the content that lives on their local network. So basically, can we point to uh, th that content, the information and files that sit on the local network, and basically try to replace right, the, the limitations of using Windows File Explorer by giving you these very nice desktop interfaces for those users to be able to search and get back to this information. So there's basically, um, there's basically three pieces of software that, that can live and be installed, you know, on computers inside your network. Two of those are just consumption apps, our, our Avail desktop app that lives in your desktop. And then we have all these browsers, right? Browser for Revit, now browsers for AutoCAD and Rhino and SketchUp and other, you know, kind of application specific ways to begin to, to, to consume content. So those are the two primary apps. And then we actually have for our enterprise customers a piece of software that runs on the server called Avail Stream. And it's basically what we would call rules-based monitoring of a file system. So basically, if a new file shows up, make sure it shows up in Avail. So it's a kind of a rules-based way of trying to watch the file system for that info to show up. So this is, you know, what we would generally call, you know, being able to Avail sit on top of your file storage system that is your network, right? It's either a local Windows server or some network attached storage of where that information is. So that's been primarily where Avail has lived. Now you start, you know, what I just showed you a second ago, we've added two new, I'll say features, and that is virtualizing these thumbnails, which can improve uh, VPN performance if that content wants to live outside your firewall. And now can we, can we take content that was inside the firewall and actually push it outside the firewall and host it in some cloud location out here, which is on the other side of this big black line. So inside the company's firewall, your company network, or is it live outside basically the cloud? So when, I, when we talk about the cloud and think about the cloud, the cloud is really just everything that's not, not your network. So it's using the internet, usually connection to get to some service. So now if you look at the outside the firewall, we're either talking about you know, cloud storage locations or, or services that you're using, right? Cloud services that you're gonna be using. So we're gonna talk primarily about storage. So when you think about storage, people usually their first, you know, interaction with a cloud storage would be one of the, what I'll call the, the, the general cloud storage solutions from all the big players, right? Microsoft has OneDrive, Google has Google Drive. Box is out there. You might be using Dropbox, right? Or Apple iCloud. Those are all forms of cloud-based storage, right? Trying to get that information back down to you. And most of those solutions end up having some way to, you know, they're either giving you a web interface for interfacing it, or they're giving you some software to make it look like it's a drive 
in your Windows File Explorer on your machine. And that's where this local caching comes back in, right? They're taking this data that's stored here and trying to make it look like just your normal drive letter on your local machine. So everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing the same thing. You can see it in, uh, you know, Autodesk does the very same thing that Google, Google does and that Microsoft does. They've got a synchronization uh, capability connector that lets your BIM 360 docs connect and synchronize data back down to your local, uh, looks like a local drive letter. Uh, if I popped up mine, you'd see every one of these connected. I've got Box, Dropbox, Google Drive, uh, OneDrive, BIM 360. I've got all these places now trying to connect and look like drive letters on my local machine. So that's really all that's going on, right? Those are all just cloud storage. Some of them are more general purpose, some of them like BIM 360 docs or what I would call vertical, right? Cloud storage industry. Adobe has their creative cloud that probably most of you have interacted with. Uh, we're not gonna get too wonky, but most all of those systems are basically storing their information behind the scenes somewhere like Amazon has a service called S3 for storage. Um, Dell has a storage solution, IBM has one, Google has one, Microsoft has one. Those systems, I'm gonna unveil some stuff here. I've tried not to put too many things to make this look too noisy, but all of these solutions then are, you know, trying to optimize between what's called cloud object storage, block storage systems, and then getting that data back down to your desk, right, in some, you know, simple way, right, for you to use. But in the end, what's important about these to keep in mind is, and I'm gonna put this, I think I put some stuff over here. You know, when you are storing information in the cloud <laughs> and you're pulling it down to some local machine to use it, it costs money, right? It costs money, right? It's not as, it's pretty cheap to store it. And what I'm showing you here, these are actually Amazon's fees for what it costs to store, uh, to move this data. It's about $90 per terabyte right now to pull data out of those cloud locations back down. So it can get really expensive if you're pulling lots of information in and out. So when I go back up to my storage solutions and you're using something like Panzura or a Nasuni or a NetApp, right? Those are global cloud file systems. Those systems though are designed to try to minimize, right, how much data that you're having to transfer at any given time. So they are sitting in between storing everything in a cloud location, but trying to cache as much of that as they can, or as little of it as they can that you need down on these local cache locations, some percentage of the total is being stored. So you're cutting down on your storage cost on any local position, but you want to cache it so that you're not having to always be transferring it over and over and over again. And every one of these solutions that you run on your desk, you'll notice is it, do you want to 100% cache this down or do you want to free up space, right? That's the way they'll refer to it, which basically purge the cache and let me have to transfer that data back down again. Well, if you're a company at scale, this can be a lot of data. We've got a lot of customers now. We've been doing some uh, very specialized stuff uh, with Panzura. Uh, you know, customers that have hundreds of terabytes of data under management. So we have um, uh, we have been working on right these kinds of solutions, especially the virtualizing the thumbnails, helps to cut down on having to transfer that data down to the local browser in order for you to see it. So that's the important piece uh, that we've been doing first with the, in conjunction with Panzura is, uh, is being able to optimize that. So I'm gonna give you a quick demo of that. Let me launch my Avail desktop again. So I've got a Panzura system actually set up here. Um, for those of you that aren't using that, you may be using something similar like a Nasuni or a NetApp, but it basically means that if the data has not been cached locally and you wanna go browse it and see images or see thumbnails in your Windows File Explorer, you're gonna have a tough time uh, being able to do that. So let me see what I've got going here. Get back into my desktop app. So I'm gonna show you two things. I've got two channels set up. I've got all, both piece of content that I'm gonna show you here in a second are, are both being hosted in my Avail um, caching server. 
but I have cleared the what's called the filer. I've cleared the cache, but if I'm gonna go to browse this Panzura on avail, and you'll notice these thumbnails coming in very quickly. This is because we used our new uh, virtualized thumbnail service on these thumbnails. So basically now those thumbnails are basically gonna come in almost as fast as I you know, can browse to see them. So we are delivering those thumbnails very quickly for somebody to be able to see those even though that file does not exist in my local system. And if I wanted to see, you know, they're high enough res, then that if I opened up my properties panel and went to my expanded view, you'll even see that they're high enough res uh, that have been virtualized for you to be able to browse that. This is all without the actual file having to be present all right, in the Panzura system. So I show you that, I've actually got some very high res video or large video files. So there that quickly, I'm seeing those video thumbnails that they came in uh, just because we virtualize those thumbnails and make that a, a great, very speedy um, uh, experience. Now I'm gonna switch to looking at the files that are sitting there that haven't been cached. So there are the video files, I'd already searched for that, but if I release, so now here's the normal experience that users would have in an environment where they now have to basically wait for those files to transfer down to the local filer system to be cached, even for your Windows File Explorer to be able to show you a thumbnail. So it's very painful uh, if you're trying to browse images or see these kinds of files and they haven't been cached. So you can see this is in real time. We'll start seeing this, the act of me trying to view those kicked in that Panzera had to start uh, trying to transfer those, but as you'll notice, It'll stop here in a second for anything that hadn't been cached. And I've got to wait and wait and wait for these to start to roll in. So very painful for those customers who've ever had this experience of having to wait for data to come from a cloud location to be coming to my local cache server. So I wanted to walk through and show this because when you are talking about cloud versus not cloud, it's really a misnomer. <laughs> You can store stuff in the cloud, but ultimately you're having to transfer that file back down in order to do something with it, consume with it. So there's a ton of advantages to starting to put these systems in place, uh, but there's also some disadvantages and that's where we're trying to bridge that gap uh, with Avail. So you can see just how slowly these files are coming in. I did this the other night. These are about 462 files. It took between 30 and 40 minutes ultimately for all these files to come in for me to be able to see them versus when I'm on the pre-virtualized version of it. If I go back to browse that, it takes me about 30 seconds to browse through every bit of this and that that was all cached um, uh, and br very browsable. Much, much more pleasant uh, experience for being able to get to that content. Let me just go back to my, uh, my slides here and do a couple more reveals. These are just some of my notes. I'm not gonna get into the details about technically what's going on on this with the way that this, those systems work. But what I'm gonna show you now is that we have been working uh, because this information and content that your companies are storing now in all these different locations, right? Company may have, have uh, you know, um, standardized on, maybe you've got uh, Panzura that you're using as your global file system, and that's your standard now network file system. So now you've got data that's living in that part of the network, but you may also be doing some sharing with people using Microsoft OneDrive, because your company's on the Microsoft platform and you're using OneDrive if you need to share data with people that are, you know, say consultants that are outside of the network. You may also have started experimenting with using uh, BIM 360 docs for your project management from Autodesk. You probably are using Adobe uh, within your organization and, you, and some people have got some stuff stuck in Adobe Creative Cloud. My point is that uh, what I like to say is information, this content wants to live in a bunch of different places for very good reasons, right? there's a reason why you're wanting to start to use BIM 360 docs for project management, but there's another reason why you've chosen Panzura for your company's global file system and network share. And there's a reason that you started using the OneDrive to share with certain people that couldn't get access to your Panzura right inside your firewall and didn't want them to and needed to share that. So what we think is that the number of places where this information is gonna to want to live 
is going to keep expanding and it's not going to slow down. We're just at the very big tip of the iceberg of all this information, an information explosion of all the different places where information wants to live. So we think that our job uh, with what we're doing with Avail is to help like what I started this out with. How do we bring that information back to the end user so that they don't have to think about where things are, location of where something is, just do I have access to it? So with that in mind, we have begun initiating what we call a Veil Connectors project. So you're going to see this. Uh, it won't roll out day one with our uh, Veil 4.0, but we're well on the way. We've actually, everything I'm showing you here, uh, we've already started doing the connections uh, via APIs to. So we started out like being able to look at, can we actually talk to the local Windows search? So anything that's on your C drive, that actually also lets us tap into things like Outlook mail, if that's uh, in the mix. But we've, we're also connecting now to Google Drive and we haven't done it yet, but OneDrive should be trivial, I'll say, for us to tap into. Uh, we've already started connecting to BIM 360 Docs. I'll give you a quick little peek of that here in a second. Uh, but uh, also, you know, if you think about not just places where you're storing information, but places where you're trying to get information. So major repositories of information like Underwriters Laboratory. We're already starting to tap in and have a relationship with them for being able to talk to their data sources and bring that to you. Uh, third party you know, aggregators of manufacturer data like Ben Smith, how do we connect into that and bring that information back to you in one interface? So um, this is what we're calling Avail Connectors. Uh, you'll see the, a lot of people using the word connectors um, and that's, uh, that's basically what's going on there. The other thing I just wanted to show you that's a challenge with these, um, with all of these solutions that you're connecting to. Uh, what I was describing earlier is that, you know, you're using, if you're using Google Drive or OneDrive or, you know, you might be using Box or Dropbox or, or any number of these kind of cloud solutions, they basically all work the same. They all have ways to either open up a web browser and go directly and browse to that information through some web interface or they usually have what's called a connector that now has some synchronization down to your local drive and they wanna make it look like it's a, a local drive letter. So the challenge though is that when you are doing that local mapping synchronization, you have to be really careful. Most of those uh, solutions, unfortunately, by default, try to install that so it looks like it's in your it's it's in what we would call your user space so the the path to that information or content would look like this c drive user space what's my last name here's my onedrive information well the problem is is if that's at a company level and you're sharing this information out and everybody's synchronizing now down to their local machine you do not have a uniform what we would call namespace for where that file now looks like it is in what would be your local cache. The only company that we've seen that does it the best, lo and behold, Google. If you install Google, they actually create a G drive and basically it's not in your local namespace. Everybody who gets that installed, right, it looks like G, it says my drive instead of being your name and then whatever the uh, you know shared drives out look like. So, they basically create a uniform namespace across the entire organization, which is great for sharing because I'm sure all of you have used applications. I'll just use Revit as an example. If you create a material in Revit and you grab a texture map into one of those materials, that is a very explicit path that's being always referenced back to when you go to use that material. That is not going to play well if you have stored your material texture library in OneDrive and are mapping that back down to a user space because whoever built the material, the explicit path to that data is going to look like this. And whenever you now share that with somebody else, they're not going to see this. They're not going to be able to what we would call resolve the, the, the path to that file uniformly across the entire company. With Google, it would actually work. So that would be a common namespace. So we're, uh, we're working on a couple of things to help resolve that. One of which is all of this to give just a couple of words. We're going to work on supporting what we call relative paths. So basically, with Avail, uh, we're going to give you a way that if you have this, um, 
this namespace problem that we're going to basically be able to resolve at a local level um, that information through a veil. It's still a big problem though at an application level. So inside of Photoshop or an Adobe product that is still trying to reference in link to a file or as I gave the example in Revit for a material or a texture, it's a really hard problem <laughs> unless we can, um, we can store information in one centralized location and then virtualize it back out so that everybody is, so it looks like the same path. It's just a really tough problem for applications that want to store explicit paths for information to solve that. We can kind of abstract if you're getting to information through a veil, uh, we, can, we can abstract that. The better answer is to have ultimately what would be called a UNC namespace, right? A uniform namespace for all of that information so that your network looks the same wherever all that information is. Then you get into another problem if you're trying to share outside your firewall to say a consultant, that if you're now sharing information with them, can we make that look the same so that you now are solving also at the application level, the mapping problem. So we're working on a couple of things on our roadmap uh, along those lines, the relative path management, but also explicit uh, kind of uniform pathing uh, management so that we can uh, solve that more broadly across across all of these environments. But um, it's a complicated problem. There's no quick, simple, easy answers for it, um, but we're working on it. So I'm gonna pause the share. I'm gonna uh, see if anybody has any questions while I fire up and give you, I'll give you a quick demo of what our new 4.0 interface looks like. All right, it looks like it's starting. Let me go back to resuming my share. Um, so this is a debug build. So let me let that connect. Uh, so what I'm gonna show you is that, assuming that I can get this fired up, um, this is what we're calling our new 4.0 interface. So uh, this is the desktop version of Avail. What you're seeing on the screen is not content, those are actually channels. So one of the number one requests that we had was to search across all the channels of information that people have in Avail. So as you can imagine, as we expand the number of places that we're touching with information, there's just gonna be more and more information that people have access to via Avail. So we went to work, we started uh, actually last summer on this initiative, and we're really close now to starting to get this in people's hands. Uh, but basically this is what we would call initially cross-channel search. So these are just channels of content. If I double click into one of these, say this Revit channel, this is gonna look substantially, except for a ton of tags, this is gonna look substantially similar to what your users are already used to seeing inside of Avail. Here's the information, the content that they're trying to get to. It's all searchable. You see the filters panel that they can use to filter out and get to information. What's uh, unique about this, uh, this new interface though is that if I search across, if I type in the word stare, one, we're gonna show you channels uh, immediately that are gonna uh, come up in this search that had the word stare in it. But if I just go ahead and hit enter, I'm doing a search across all of my information and content that I have access to uh, for that word stare. Um, so you can see here that I'm seeing lots of things related to stairs. Uh, what's important here in this part of the interface is that we, we think about this as a kind of a progressive search. When you're searching a lot of information, a lot of content, especially if you just type in a word or two, you can potentially get back a lot of information. So we would call that noisy search results. A lot of noise trying to help you get, you know, that's in the way of getting to what you're trying to get to. So the way that we're approaching this is when you do these kinds of searches across these very large bodies of information, can we now give you back information to help you filter down to what exactly that you're looking for? So we think of this as a kind of a progressive search. Can you in, in a two or three button clicks get to what you're looking for? So what you're seeing up here above in this, uh, in this little um, top row is that while we got back all these search results for stairs, we're telling you where we found these results. So for instance, we found a, a channel that had Rhino models in it. So we can just in one click filter down. There was a stair and railing system channel that had information in it. There was a Revit 2020 you know, channel of content that had that information in it. 
here was a Revit, here's a bunch of Revit projects that are being accessed uh, that have that information in it. So what happens is if you then double click on one of those sources, we put you into that channel, but we've already narrowed down your search results and now present you with the secondary information. Yes, I'm looking for sheets related to stairs in a specific project. So that quickly we're helping you to narrow down in two or three button clicks to be able to get back to that information. If I go back out front and I search for something like, I'll just use the word blue, what you're gonna see is that lots of things that might be related to blue. It could be materials in my visualization projects, could be my marketing assets that are blue. It could be third party uh, libraries. Here you can see ArcVision's RPC cars or other kinds of assets that are blue. There's a beer can that's blue moon. Uh, so again, up across the top, I can say, am I looking for V-Ray materials that are blue? Am I looking for marketing assets that are blue? Or am I in that RPC channel seeing everything that's been tagged as blue there? Again, if I double click into that channel, I'm now brought into a sub search uh, that was related to all that content that was blue. And uh, if I were to then, let's see why my thumbnails aren't coming in. There they come. Uh, and then if I look below, I can narrow down and say, yeah, I'm looking for the bottles and cans that were blue. There's that blue moon uh, beer can that was available to me. So uh, we're pretty excited about where this is going. The other thing that I'll show you, uh, we haven't started wiring those connectors in, but I'll give you a little taste of what that looks like. I can go to my Google Drive that you can see here, and I'm not gonna display everything that's Google Drive if I connect into there, but if I do perform a search like and I'm gonna type in analytics, if I could type. I basically had to, I had pre-authenticated to my Google Drive account so it knows who I am, so it knows what I have access to. And when I type in that search, it's, uh, here's Bim Smith. So if I type the word bollard. So this is actually, uh, BIM Smith, which is an aggregator of content. So if you went to their website right now and went to their uh, BIM Smith uh, marketplace and looked for bollards from manufacturers, you would see these very same search results. We're actually searching using their APIs for that content and bringing it back. So that's a good example where we're going to start tapping into these resources. Let's see if I can get my Forge account to work. If I go into Forge and I know I've got some photos up there look for a photo from a project called Fermini, which is a beautiful church in Fermini, France, originally designed by Le Cabousier. There they come. So those photos are actually in Forge and I'm pulling them back and displaying them in Avail. So I just wanted to give you a kind of a quick taste of how these connectors are gonna start to let us connect into these uh, you know, other places where you have information that are gonna be combined with your local information that you're working on. So uh, pretty excited. And uh, we think that we'll, as, as soon as we get our 4.0, um, as soon as we get our 4.0 version out, we'll begin releasing these connectors, uh, kind of slow rolling those out as part of this. So I'll, um, that's all I had planned to kind of show you, but I'm happy to open this up for any questions or actually if somebody even wanted to raise their hand and ask a voice question, I can give you a uh, ability to speak. Tom, I think I turned your audio on. Hey, Will. So, Regarding the downloading from the cloud and the cache, it, back it, just to kind of clarify what I was asking, one of the things that I've seen in some situations is you make a change to the library somewhere, and and this isn't necessarily for avail. So you, you know, I'm not I'm not blaming a general you about question. This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you've made a change, but the download is already cached. So is avail paying attention to that? differential and going, oh, you know, we can't just give you your cache file. You've got to get another version at this point. I mean, uh, is it paying yep. attention to that at any level? Not yet. And that's why we, I say we slow rolled this 3.15 kind of, we kind of released the host and cloud uh, very quietly, I'll say. <laughs> we're yeah. talking about it and letting customers start to do it, but we're, you know, we haven't integrated those kinds of features, but 
we're well suited now to be able to start to do that. So like some indicator, say when I was in Revit and I pulled that cloud uh, up, if I'd already downloaded that and your master had changed, we yeah. can actually know that. And we could now give an indicator in the interface that, hey, there's an update available. Our uh, kind of philosophy around that is to always give the end user the option, give them the information, let them decide what they want to do. Hey, that's not bad. Yeah, at least, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, just notifying them is is half the battle. Yeah, yep, yep. let them All know, right. and and it gets very, you know, in this industry especially, because we've been thinking about this for quite a while as we've been building out this infrastructure. I'll say to be able to do this, and some of that conversation is like third party, like a manu something from Underwriters Laboratory. Yeah, so you exactly. might you might have pulled that down a year ago, right? And it's sitting in your project. Well. Uh, if they've updated, say, a fire, let's say the fire safety information expired, right? It's actually out of date. That certificate is no, or, you know, sustainability data is now not, uh, you know, valid. What you'd really like to do is to know that there's a new version of it available, but we're very cognizant of, I don't want to write over top automatically of something that you've got in one of your projects or your project directory. We feel like yeah. our role is going to be, show you, make sure that you're very aware that this information may be stale or out of date, and then give you the option. Do you want to pull down the new version of that and update it and keep this stuff synced? So we're, we're definitely moving in that direction. We've kind of got the plumbing in place to start to be able to do it. And you'll start, hopefully start to see us quickly rolling out those kinds of features along the way. All right. Thanks. Thank you. I like it when people ask questions, it makes it much more interactive. It's exciting. I haven't seen the little blue hand go up. I totally <laughs> missed it. We'll save the day. We'll talk to Tom. I, uh, I, I, uh, ha I teach a class at the university, just a quick side story. Uh, and I taught it this past spring and we had to do the whole second half via zoom. And I had one, uh, it, it wasn't even zoom. That was a problem. It's like with any classroom of students like that, they generally are all sitting there being quiet, even when you're face to face in the classroom with them, trying to get them to, interact and ask you questions was always a tough time. But I had one student, one young lady that was, you know, she, she would always raise her hand and when I'd ask something and, and would be all over it. And then when we went to Zoom, it was even tougher to get people to do something. But she, again, would turn her camera on and she'd ask all these great questions, which for me was great. And then I saw the student evaluations for the class and one student was complaining that I had a favorite. It was clear that I had a favorite in the class. I'm like, oh, you can't win for losing. It's like, unless you raise your hand or you go out and ask the question, uh, you know, I can only interact with those that, uh, that that are willing to raise their hand or willing to speak up and ask a question. So, uh, but anyway, hopefully uh, that was probably quite a bit uh, to throw at you. I've tried to keep it pretty high level. Didn't, I don't want it to be too technical, not knowing who all's on this call about what's going on. But uh, I think to kind of sum this up, um, obviously cloud, cloud storage, moving and where information is, is complex. And I think it's gonna keep getting even more complex. I don't think it's gonna get easier. And that's, you know, that's both uh, disappointing, uh, but also where we feel like we've got a role in life and what we're kind of getting up every day thinking about and trying to help solve is to, is to try to take some of that complexity out of it. Especially, you know, I always say on behalf of the end user, it's like, I can't expect somebody sitting at their desk every day to understand or to even care about a kind of all these complexities. They're just trying to get their work done. So what we're trying to do with Avail is to try to take the, you know, really take location out, which is a very complex concept to think about where things are and trying to make that easy enough to, uh, to get the, what they need to get their work done uh, when they need it just in time. Um, so that's really been our, our, you know, high level goal with this. So we had a, a couple of thanks come through. So, okay. Well, good. Well, thanks everybody for joining. And if there's uh, anything you want to follow up with us afterwards, you can, uh, ping us. Will, are you still on? Sales I'm still at, here. Where do, yep. where, sales at getavail.com. Sales get um, if you're not an existing customer, if you yep. are an existing customer, you can reach out to success at getavail.com. Yes. Success. And success. Then, and then if there's other, you can always ping our support at get avail and Todd or me or somebody else will see that stuff come through and try to address it. So anyway, there's been uh, I think there's uh, I think we're poised. We've got a lot of stuff that's uh, we've been hard at work on. 
uh, going to be rolling out the next six months. I think will be exciting to kind of see all this start to come together. So thanks everybody for joining. Uh, feel free to reach out if we didn't get everything answered for you.